Last night, the party showcased their diversity by giving speakers slots to all four of America's black Trump supporters. And I don't know what they're gonna do for the rest of the week. I mean, Tim Scott has already spoken. So they're gonna have to bring him back out on Wednesday with a fake mustache like, hello, it's me, Senator Brimschmott, and I also support Donald Trump. And while some of the black speakers last night attested to how not racist Trump is, one of the speakers went even further and declared that the real racists are the Democrats. You may be wondering, why is a lifelong Democrat speaking at the Republican National Convention? And that's a fair question. And here's your answer. The Democratic Party does not want black people to leave their mental plantation. We've been forced to be there for decades and generations. But I have news for Joe Biden. We are free. We are free people with free minds. So let me get this straight. When other groups organize and vote by their interests, they get a fancy name like voting blocks. But when black people do it, you get told you're acting like an extra on roots. And why is it that the people who always say, you should be a free thinker, have a very specific set of instructions on how to think? Think for yourselves, black people. All right, man, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna vote for the Democrats. No, I said, think for yourselves, vote Republican. Okay, maybe I'll vote independent. Yo, you better start thinking for yourself. I mean, black women in this country vote Democrat more than anybody else. And I'll tell you now, nobody is more of a free thinker than a black woman. I dare you to try and brainwash a black woman. You'll come out of there joining her cult. I'm in the cult of, I should have shut my mouth. And also this argument is especially confusing coming from this dude, because he's saying the Democrats are trying to enslave you. Also, I'm a lifelong Democrat. That's like every confused meme on the internet at once. Like, does that mean he's keeping his own voters on the mental plantation? I feel like I need to watch 12 years of mental slave to understand what the fuck he's talking about. Now, to be fair, it's not that the RNC completely denied the existence of racism in America. They just think that racism is a less systemic problem and more of a personal obstacle on the way to an inspirational triumph. And two of their best speeches actually came from people who have made that exact journey. America is not a racist country. My father wore a turban. My mother wore a sari. I was a brown girl in a black and white world. We faced discrimination and hardship, but my parents never gave in to grievance and hate. My grandfather's 99th birthday would have been tomorrow. He suffered the indignity of being forced out of school as a third grader, yet he lived long enough to see his grandson become the first African-American to be elected to both the United States House and the United States Senate in the history of this country. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. Look, whatever you think about Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, you cannot deny that they have inspiring stories. But here's the thing about them using their stories to show how exceptional America is. Haley and Scott are literally the exceptions. The fact that Tim Scott is one of the only black senators and Nikki Haley was one of the only minority governors is, if anything, an argument for the existence of systemic racism in America, not against it. Imagine being the sole survivor of a plane crash, looking around at the wreckage and going, wow, I wish all these other passengers could have persevered and overcome this crash just like me. Shout out to Boeing. I mean, if America didn't have a racism problem, then their achievements wouldn't be a big deal. Getting elected as a minority would be as easy as, say, mailing a letter. Well, I mean, that's a bad example, but you know what I mean. What I want is a world where a black man becoming a senator isn't inspirational. That's when black people will have really made it. When there's a black senator who's just like, yeah, so my dad was a CEO and uh, then his billionaire friend started a super PAC, so I guess I'm here now. Of course, there's really only one speaker anyone at the Republican convention wants to hear from. And that's Donald Jerry Falwell Trump. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that the president did not speak in primetime last night, but we did get a speech from his oldest disappointment, Don Jr., who briefly turned the convention into an infomercial. My father's entire worldview revolves around the idea that we can always do even better. Imagine the life you want to have, one with a great job, a beautiful home, a perfect family. You can have it. Imagine the country you want to live in, one with true, equal opportunity. You can have it. Heroes are celebrated and the good guys win. 
You can have it. That is the life. That is the country. That is the world that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are after. And yes, you can have it. Honestly, put your hating aside, you have to admit Don Jr. would make a great motivational speaker. And not in the traditional way, where he inspires you with quotes, more like in a way where people would look at him and say, that guy can run a giant company and speak at a major political convention. That guy? Just imagine what I can accomplish if I put my mind to it. Also, if Donald Trump has already been president for almost four years, then why do we still have to imagine how great life could be if he was president? Trump's presidency is like your 48-year-old cousin's DJ career. If it hasn't been successful by now, it's not gonna be. But if Don Jr. couldn't get you on board with his vision of America, maybe the problem was that your TV volume wasn't loud enough. In which case, Don's girlfriend and former Fox News host Kimberly Guilfoyle turned it up for you. Do you believe in American greatness? Believe in yourself, in President Trump. His promise was to put America first, and he has. President Trump believes in you. He emancipates and lifts you up to live your American dream. You are capable, you are qualified, you are powerful, and you have the ability to choose your life and determine your destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. Did that seem kind of loud to anyone? First of all, I wanna wish a speedy recovery to anyone who was listening on headphones. I'm praying for you. And I guess we also found the one person who actually signed up for Rudy Giuliani's masterclass. America! You know when you're at a party and the music turns off and then all of a sudden you're talking way too loud? That's basically what Guilfoyle did for an entire speech. And then I shat my pants! And aside from the speech being so loud that Canada called the cops, the actual content was also ridiculous. Donald Trump believes in me? The dude also believes in Kim Jong-un and hydroxychloroquine. I don't wanna be in that group. <laughs> Yesterday was night two of the Republican National Convention, the biggest week for Trump campaign staffers who aren't currently in prison. And the night got off to a rocky start when one speaker was pulled at the last minute for tweeting out an anti-Semitic QAnon conspiracy theory. And I, for one, I'm really glad because I don't know about you, but when I sit down to watch the Republican National Convention, I don't wanna hear anything crazy, but I'm worried that this does set a dangerous precedent because now there's a 95% chance that Trump also gets the boot come Thursday. That wasn't a tweet. I just retweeted it, guys. What's wrong with you? But after that rocky start, who better to smooth things over than Vice President of the United States and elevator music in human form, Mr. Mike Pence. Pence appeared in a video that was too boring for me to remember what happened, except that he was standing outside Abraham Lincoln's boyhood cabin, and he also took the bold step of appearing alone with a woman who was not mother, or as he calls it, doggy style. Then later on, there was a segment making the case that Trump is also a feminist hero because he's hired a bunch of women. And although some people might argue, you have to admit, Trump is an ally to women. Just look at the facts. He appointed a young up-and-coming woman to a high-level position despite having zero experience. He gave women like Kellyanne Conway and Sarah Sanders the opportunity to lie to the American people, a job traditionally reserved for men. And he alone stood by Ghislaine Maxwell when no one else would. If that doesn't make him a feminist, then maybe I don't know what the word means. But the main event of the evening was the speech from first lady and woman who just betrayed James Bond, Melania Trump. She showed once again why she is the most popular Trump. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. I don't want to use this precious time attacking the other side, because as we saw last week, that kind of talk only serves to divide the country further. 
This modern world is moving so fast, and our children face challenges that seem to change every few months. Just like me, I know many of you watch how mean and manipulative social media can be. We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Okay, is it just me? Or does every Melania speech seem like she's taking shots at her husband? She called it COVID-19 instead of China virus. She said people on social media are too mean. Oh. And she said that America deserves an honest president. I was watching this like, damn, she may have gotten rid of the trees in the Rose Garden, but she made sure to bring her own shade. I mean, no wonder Trump was sitting there the whole time looking like he was watching his own colonoscopy. But aside from Trump, it turns out that a lot of people really loved Melania's speech. Melania Trump delivered a, a very impressive speech from the Rose Garden, the White House. Addressing pointedly and movingly the number one crisis issue facing the United States right now, the coronavirus pandemic. She did touch on and did speak to the reality that is going on in a way that we haven't heard uh, many other, if any other speakers really do. She acknowledged what people are feeling. Ah, yes, it's true. Melania spoke with optimism and empathy when everyone else was dark and fearful. It's almost like when they went low, she went high. Have I heard that somewhere before? And I know right now you might be saying, come on, Trevor, why does Melania deserve praise for just sympathizing with coronavirus victims? Well, I'll tell you why. Have you seen the rest of the convention, right? Everyone else is acting like the pandemic never happened or that it magically ended a long time ago. Like, I know the bar is low, but at least she stepped over it. It's easy to be best when everyone else is being worst. And maybe you don't think Melania's sympathy is worth anything, but sympathy is all she can offer because she doesn't have any power. And don't tell me, no, she should force Trump to do more about Corona. Guys, Melania can't make Trump do shit. If she had any power, do you think she would let him dress the way he does? I mean, look at them. Melania looks like she's got fashion designers on speed dial, whereas Trump Looks like he stole his suit off of a parade balloon version of himself. Now, Melania wasn't the only Trump family member who spoke last night. We also heard from the president's youngest daughter, Tiffany, who said she was having difficulty finding a job right now. I mean, dude, can't her dad at least hook her up with a job in the mailroom? Or I guess in this case, a job sabotaging the mailroom? And of course, there was an appearance by the ultimate forgotten man, Eric Trump who took full advantage of the fact that perhaps for the first time in years, his dad was probably listening to him. In closing, I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. I'm proud of what you're doing for this country. I'm proud to show my children what their grandfather is fighting for. You are making America strong again. You are making America safe again. You are making America proud again. I love you very much. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Man, I feel bad for Eric. Imagine having to talk to your dad through the TV. It's sad, because you can talk to someone through a TV, but there's no way to know if they're listening. Isn't that right, J-Lo? <laughs> That's nice of you to say, I miss you too. And knowing the Donald, Eric's speech is probably the exact moment he decided to go to the concession stand to get more nachos. Part of what made Pence's speech interesting was how he's able to hide so much bullshit underneath the veneer of a respectable small town pasta. In fact, he actually made me appreciate Trump because Trump says bullshit in a bullshit way. That's always easy to spot. Like this. You mentioned the Bible. You've been talking about how it's your favorite book. And you said, I think last night in Iowa, some people are surprised that you say that. I'm wondering what one or two of your most favorite Bible uh, verses are well, and why. I, I wouldn't want to get into it because to me, that's very personal. You know, when I talk about the Bible, it's very personal. So I don't want to get into there's verses. No, I don't no want to get into it. There's no, no I, verse I, that means I a lot to you that you think about or cite. The, the Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. Even to cite a verse that no, you like. No, I don't want to do that. You're I mean, an Old okay. Testament guy or a New Testament guy? Uh, probably equal. See? Obvious bullshit. 
We all know that man has never read the Bible. Now, granted, he's never read any book, but he specifically never read the Bible, which is your favorite. But with Mike Pence, if you're not paying attention, he comes across as a reasonable guy. You know, it's the same way I didn't trust anything that the Tiger King said, but when Doc Antle spoke, he almost made me believe that he wasn't running a wild animal sex cult. It just seemed like everyone was just doing their thing. And last night was Mike Pence at his finest. Cool, calm, and full of BS. Starting with the way he talked about the civil unrest happening in America's cities. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. President Trump and I know that the men and women that put on the uniform of law enforcement are the best of us. Every day, when they walk out that door, they consider our lives more important than their own. People like Dave Patrick Underwood, an officer in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service who was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. First off, Pence says that an officer was killed during the riots in Oakland, which gives you the impression that the officer was killed by rioters, right? The truth is, the person charged with killing Officer Underwood is a right-wing terrorist. You know, it's sort of like saying that Bruce Lee died during the Vietnam War. Yeah, technically that's correct because he died in 1973, but it's not while he was fighting the Viet Cong. You gotta tell the truth, people. Bruce Lee was killed by the Illuminati. When Pence says that Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence during the convention, he's giving you the impression that Biden supports the riots, when in fact, Biden condemned them a few months ago when they started, and he continued condemning them again yesterday when they kicked off in Kenosha. And that's what makes Mike Pence so slick. He doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. He just implies. But that's fine, I guess, you know? There's no commandment that says, thou shalt not suggest false witness against thy neighbor. So, according to Mike Pence, America under President Trump is falling into anarchy, but you'll never guess whose fault it actually is. Joe Biden says that America is systemically racist and that law enforcement in America has, and I quote, an implicit bias against minorities. Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities. The hard truth is, You won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. That's right. You see all the bad stuff that's happening in Trump's America? Well, that's actually Joe Biden's America. So wait, when is it Trump's America? When things are going well. And as for the idea that you won't be safe when Joe Biden is president, people are not safe now! Forget the riots, coronavirus is waiting to punch me in the lungs as soon as I leave the house. You won't be safe in the future. Bitch, I can't even go to a Denny's right now. So Mike Pence talking about riots and protests wasn't exactly on the up and up, but it was nothing compared to his bullshit about Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic, which to hear him tell it was more perfect than Trump's call with Ukraine. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the president took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now that action saved untold American lives. And I can tell you firsthand, it bought us invaluable time to launch the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President Trump marshaled the full resources of our federal government from the outset. He directed us to forge a seamless partnership with governors across America in both political parties. Today, we're conducting more than 800,000 tests a day, and we have coordinated the delivery of billions of pieces of personal protective equipment for our amazing doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I'm actually kind of impressed by how much cow excrement 
Pence managed to pack in here. Because yes, America is doing 800,000 tests a day now. What Pence doesn't mention is the many months where America did basically no testing and that Trump himself wants there to be less testing. Pence brags about coordinating the delivery of PPE. What he doesn't mention is that America was so disorganized on PPE that nurses were wrapping themselves up in garbage bags, running around looking like some kind of broke-ass Missy Elliotts. I mean, it's great that you bought invaluable time to launch a national mobilization, but what would have been even better was if you actually used that invaluable time to actually do the national mobilization. Oh, and as for the seamless partnership with America's governors, I assume Pence is referring to when Trump told Democratic governors that they would only get help if they were nice to him? I mean, I guess that's a seamless partnership. The same way when a guy walks into the bank and tells someone to put the money in the bag, they put the money in the bag. Hashtag teamwork. Now, to be fair, Mike Pence did admit that America hasn't completely solved coronavirus. But then he got mad that Joe Biden said finishing the job would take actual work. Now, last week, Joe Biden said that no miracle is coming. Well, what Joe doesn't seem to understand is that America is a nation of miracles. And I'm proud to report that we're on track to have the world's first safe, effective coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year. Wow, what a miracle. We might be getting the vaccine at some point and only 200,000 people had to die first. Take that, Joe Biden. The final night of the Republican National Convention, also known as the place where Facebook comments come to life. And this, was the night that everyone was waiting for, the acceptance speech of Donald Just the Tip Trump. But before the speech even started, we got this incredible moment between Trump's first lady and Melania. Oh my God, did you guys see that? Play it again. God damn. As soon as Ivanka walked by, Melania's smile disappeared faster than all the blackface episodes of all your favorite sitcoms. And it's moments like these that just add more fuel to the rumors that Melania does not like Ivanka. And look, I don't blame her. I mean, after all, Ivanka's the one who's in charge of tackling Melania when she makes a run for it. No wonder they got bad blood. But once the traditional exchange of fake smiles was complete, President Trump descended the majestic stairs of the White House, walked up to the podium, and then delivered the longest, most boring, low energy Jeb Bush ass speech of his entire life. Damn, that shit was boring. And I would be so pissed off if I was one of the people in the audience. Because if I'm sitting in a crowd risking catching coronavirus to watch a Trump speech, God damn it, I want a Trump speech. I want to hear his plans for locking Hillary up while chugging hydroxychloroquine. I want him to accuse Nancy Pelosi of creeping into your houses at night, turning up your air conditioning, and stealing your blankets. I want to see him hold up a big case of 10-year-old Trump steaks, say that they're the real cure for corona, and then start throwing them into the crowd, paper towel style. But this speech, man, This speech was like going to a NASCAR race and watching the cars parallel park for three hours. Where's the crash? Honestly, it was really weird. Because say what you want about Trump. The one thing we all know about the man is that he can give exciting speeches that hold people's attention. So why now, with one of the most important speeches he will ever have to give, did Trump resort to reading the Wikipedia entry for history of the 19th century? Our American ancestors, sailed across the perilous ocean to build. These pioneers didn't have money. Climbed into their covered wagons and set out west for the next adventure. Davy Crockett and Buffalo Bill. Cowboys and sheriffs. They pressed on past the Mississippi. Built the great ships. Raised up the skyscrapers. From Normandy to Iwo Jima. And we did it all with style and confidence We built a six million pound rocket and launched it thousands of miles into space. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are unbeatable. Huh, what? No, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening. People, what the hell was that? Like, I don't know what was worse, the perilous journey that those pioneers faced trekking across the country 
or having to sit through Trump telling us about it. I mean, the last people that told stories that boring were the actual pioneers, and that's because the only other things they could do were chop wood or die. It's like Trump turned Oregon Trail into an audiobook. And by the time the speech was over, I bet half the people in the audience died of dysentery. So, now we know. President Trump is a terrible president, but we also know that he'd be an even worse substitute history teacher. Sometimes you gotta know when to just play the Space Jam DVD, man. Give up. But still, if anyone managed to stay awake during Trump's 70-minute Ben Carson impersonation, they might have picked up on one major theme. You see, for months, Trump has been saying that sleepy Joe Biden is too weak to run America. But he's also been saying that Joe Biden is a radical socialist who's gonna destroy America. But how can both of those be true? Well, now he's figured it out. Sleepy Joe Biden is so weak that other radical socialists will destroy America for him. Joe Biden is weak. He takes his marching orders from liberal hypocrites who drive their cities into the ground while fleeing far from the scene of the wreckage. Make no mistake, if you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. If Joe Biden doesn't have the strength to stand up to wild-eyed Marxists like Bernie Sanders and his fellow radicals, and there are many, there are many, many, we see them all the time, it's incredible, actually, then how is he ever going to stand up for you? He's not. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. Ooh, the Trojan horse of socialism. Sounds terrifying. In fact, they should turn it into a movie. Wow, look at the amazing, totally harmless, and almost certainly empty giant horse. Now we can attack the city and give them all universal health care. Find their women, and give them paid maternity leave. Prepare to have your minimum wage raised! Huh. Not as scary as I thought. Seriously, though, it's starting to feel like be scared of the socialists is becoming the Republicans' only move. Which, honestly, is just getting old. You know? It's like the GOP is that one friend of yours in Street Fighter who just did the chopping thing the entire time. <laughs> You're not playing the game, Justin! <laughs> but in a way, the biggest message that Trump sent last night wasn't in anything that he said at all, no. It was in the setting of the speech. And that message was, coronavirus ain't shit. The South Lawn of the White House converted into a packed convention floor. Nearly 2,000 supporters, no social distancing, and very few masks. You're seeing people shake hands, hug, greet each other like it would be in normal times. It's almost as if he is trolling people who are concerned about testing and masks and the coronavirus. What happened last night was dangerous. It was in violation of the president's administration's own health guidelines. Most people were not tested. This was something that indeed could become a super spreader event. Yes, even in a pandemic, Trump needed to have a packed crowd. I mean, look at that. The only empty seat is Herman Cain's. And it wasn't just a packed crowd. Practically nobody wore a mask and practically nobody was tested. Trump basically decided his speech was gonna kill one way or another. In fact, the only guest required to wear a face mask was Stephen Miller, and that wasn't coronavirus-related. I guess the one silver lining is that Trump's speech was so boring that there was no risk that anybody would spread droplets by cheering. But in many ways, this is Trump's coronavirus response in a nutshell. His top priority isn't health or safety. His top priority is making Donald Trump look good. Nearly 4,000 Americans died during the four nights of the RNC. But Trump won't let that get in the way of a good TV backdrop. In fact, when asked about the lack of precautions at the speech, a White House official said, quote, everybody is going to catch this thing eventually. And if that's the attitude of the White House, then I'm disappointed. Because the Trump I know doesn't quit. When he had an affair with Stormy Daniels, he didn't just go, well, everybody's gonna know about this eventually. No, he paid her off. He signed NDAs. He did everything he could to make her go away. In fact, maybe we should get Trump 
to ban COVID-19, then we know he'll shut it down. 